the goodness of God. That is a, a foundational belief in your life that God is good. And I like the idea that he chases after me with it. Well, hey, before I get going uh, on preaching, I asked uh, the students to stay in for a minute because many of them start school this week and I wanted to pray for them. So um, yeah, and the parents said, amen, get them on out. Uh, so what do, we, what do we got here? We got some seventh graders, anything different? What are you? Fifth? Fifth, 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 okay, so, all right. All right. High schoolers, you don't need, you're good. Stuck. Middle schoolers need prayer, I'm just kidding for real, but uh, yeah, this is going to be an important year for you guys. And uh, I want to start off by praying for you. So uh, parents for real though, I, I feel like this is one where we need to lean in and, and kind of don't just listen, but, but pray with me. Uh, Lord, I bring this group of students before you, Lord. I just want to <laughs> lay them out and uh, man, Lord, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, high school, such important years, Lord. Things will happen this year that will mark them, that, will, that could change like the course of their life, Lord. And I, I just pray that your hand is on them. Lord, I pray that they would be influencers, not the influenced. I pray that they would have a thick skin and a soft heart, that they would be light in a dark place. Uh, and they would feel your presence, Lord. Guide them on every little step. One of, those, one of those steps could be that really important one, Lord. And I just pray that you are there in that step. And I pray that those of us who are parents, that you would give us supernatural wisdom and patience uh, as they take this journey. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. Yeah, we can clap for them. That actually is another thing that they need to get better at is clapping. No, not like that. You guys just don't have, you're not on time when you clap during worship and it's weird, but that's all right. One of our values here is sarcasm and making fun of people, as you can tell specifically, um, two of them are mine, by the way, so I'm allowed to be like that. Uh, well, hey, if this is your first time here, my name's Adam. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here, not senior yet, because I'm not that old. Um, and that is not a position we hold. All right, we're, we're in a series called uh, Vibe Check, where we're looking at really uh, attitudes that you can kind of carry with you in life. Uh, and this is week two. We hit complaining last week. So if you missed that, congratulations. Uh, you didn't have to get punched in the face with that one. So uh, today, uh, I started thinking this week, uh, you ever wonder like where certain like sayings come from. We say weird things. Sometimes you have those little weird sayings and, and like what the origin of them are. So I'm like nerdy enough to say, I want to actually look this up. Where did this come from? And I found three that are really interesting to me. So uh, have you ever heard the, the phrase, turn a blind eye to something? Um, you know, obviously means to like look or not look at something maybe you're supposed to look at, but its origins are really interesting. Uh, it finds uh, its origins in the British naval history in like 1801, uh, a captain named Horatio Nelson. Fun fact about Captain Horatio is that he uh, was missing an eye. Um, so he only had one. Uh, they're in this battle with some other nation, uh, Danish, maybe one of our history majors came up and corrected me after first service and I said I didn't care. Um, <laughs> I could say America and you'd be like, okay, like you wouldn't, wouldn't know. Uh, so they're in this battle, they were outnumbered and uh, Horatio's uh, ship was not the lead ship. There was another, uh, the Admiral was in a different ship and the Admiral decided that they were gonna retreat. So he starts signaling to Horatio's boat uh, that they're gonna retreat. So Horatio puts his little scope up to his missing eye and says, I don't see the signal. And then they just keep attacking, which makes me like Horatio a lot. Uh, and they ended up winning, at least that's what uh, the legend says. So turn a blind eye, uh, that's where that comes from. Have you ever heard don't, uh, can't hold a candle to? You know, like can, you know, Domino's pizza can't hold a candle to Giannino's pizza, something like that you might say, you should say, because Domino's is terrible. Um, 
really interesting. This one goes way back before electricity. So apprentices uh, used to, one of the apprentices' job would be to hold a candle for an artist. So if they were sitting under an artist, uh, trying to learn from the artist, you know, in the darker times, they would hold a candle so the artist could continue painting. And the phrase actually comes from an apprentice not holding a candle correctly. <laughs> kind of like, you know, when you were trying to help your dad fix his car and you were holding a flashlight and he started telling you you're holding a flashlight wrong and you start freaking out. Kind of like that. Um, but essentially, and this is the line that, that was written that just struck me. Um, it's a way of saying you're not even fit to be the assistant, much less the artist. So that's like really mean. <laughs> If you ever say that to somebody, I, I don't know. I like the saying more now because of it. And then last one, uh, green with envy. Green with envy. Uh, it, some historians say that the origins were uh, it, with Shakespeare. Shakespeare invented a lot of sayings. It's actually a line out of Othello. It says this, Beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. What does that mean? I don't know. Shakespeare's deep, very deep. Um, but as you can see, you got jealousy, you got green and there, and those two things are kind of together. But actually many scholars believe it goes further back into ancient Greece where a green complexion uh, had to do with illness. So back then, you know, if, uh, I think they said blocked bile duct could make you look green. Um, and then they started associating green and sickness with envy. So they, that really the saying actually is, is expressing that you're sick with envy, it's not about the color, it's about being sick with this thing. And the vibe we're gonna look at today is envy. An envious vibe that you can have. Green with envy, sick with envy, a monster uh, that can cause serious damage in your life. And I wanna define it. I'm gonna define it in a little different way than maybe you'd be used to, uh, but I'm trying to boil it all the way down to its most basic part. So here's my definition of envy for you. You want what you don't have. You want what you don't have. Now, I left off a key part of that and I, you might have noticed, usually it would be, you want what you don't have and others do have, right? But I'm gonna, the reason I wanna leave that off, usually usually envy carries that extra piece of, of the other person having it and you not having it. I wanna leave that off because I don't wanna talk about them. I don't, I don't wanna focus on what somebody else has. I wanna focus here, the real problem, the, the place where this uh, resides is inside of you and inside of me. So I want to talk about what uh, this, this desire for what you don't have. Uh, Proverbs 14.30 says this, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones, rots the bones. So envy is a monster, a disease that rots us from the inside out. Now, there's a little problem with my definition. I want to point it out. Some of you are very astute. You don't just notice my mistakes with uh, 1800s naval battles. You also notice other things. Um, so you might be sitting here thinking, hold up, according to your definition, are you telling me that me wanting something is a sin? If I want something, I'm doing something wrong. Is, it, that, is that what that means? That if I want something, it's going to rot me in my bones? Is that really what you're saying, because if that's the case, I'm, I'm in trouble here, right? Um, so I just wanna say like, I, I'll, I'll go for, I want stuff, right? I see, I see an old dude driving down the road in one of those new Corvettes that kind of look like a Ferrari and I want that, right? I want, I want to be old, but I want that, I want that. I feel like you have to be old to own a, Cor a Corvette like that. I'm sorry if you, I didn't look in the parking lot. I don't know if anybody has one. Um, when I drive by certain neighborhoods, you know, those neighborhoods with like the two acre lots that have like the, the yard that looks like a golf course and a house that looks like it ate two other houses. You know, those, those I, I, like I want that. That just, just kind of happens, right? Um, when I see people, uh, pictures of people uh, taking uh, like beach vacations without their kids, <laughs> I want that. I want that. The second part, really, a lot. Um, when I see a giant church building with like a sprawling parking lot and a really tall steeple, no, just me, all right. It's called steeple envy. No. <laughs> I'm usually, I usually say that kind of stuff first service, so welcome if you're watching online. Just fast forward that part. Uh, is wanting something sinful? 
Uh, well, I want to say it really can't be, right? I mean, some of our desires, some of the desires that you have inside of you, they are, uh, I would say, God-given, right? They are good. They come from God. They come from the way he designed you. He created us to be uh, beings that have desires, right? That's a part of how he knit us together. And you can want some good things in your life, right? If you're single and you want a spouse, that's a good thing. That's even, I would say, a God thing, right? Uh, if you don't have any kids and you want to have kids, that's a good thing. If you... Uh, want a job that supports your family, that's a good thing. If you want to be healthy, that's a good thing. There are some good things that you can desire in your life. And I would even say that God gave you those desires. So what's the difference between wanting something and envy? That's important, right? That's a really important distinction to say, I want some things, but I don't, I mean, if, if you're a Christian and you're saying, I want to live the way God wants me to live, I don't want to envy. I don't want to go there. So what's the difference between wanting and envy? I wish I could just give you like one little catchy sentence and that would be it. And you'd be like, oh, okay, I see what envy is now, but it's a little more complicated than that. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you a whole bunch of little statements that if, if you, I guess, kind of questions almost that if you say yes to them, you've slipped from wanting into envy. Okay, and there's a bunch. I didn't even count. Eight. There's eight. That's a weird number. That's why I didn't count. 10 would have been better. I should come up with two more. I hate that, but whatever. How are you guys doing today? You're not laughing at my jokes, so that's lame. Should get on that. I'm grading you. I know some of you, you know, when you go to lunch and you talk about the pastor, well, I'm going to talk about you. So you do, do better, do better. Um, all right. Difference between envy and just a God-given desire. It goes from desire to envy when you become bitter and angry at God because you don't have it. When you become bitter and angry at God. When, uh, when your relationship with God changes because you don't have that desire, you flipped. And that's a big one. So you got to think about that. What is my relationship with God? How has it changed based on my desire? You got to ask that. Second one, when you become bitter and angry at someone who does have it. Right? You could look across the street and you can see that this person has that thing and you don't have that thing and you become bitter and angry at them. And if you're really, really, really honest, the reason you don't like them anymore is because they have and you don't. It goes from wanting to envy when you secretly celebrate someone losing it. That's when you don't tell anybody about that, right? Like maybe your best, best, best friend and you're both messed up together. Maybe that one. But mostly you keep that one way to yourself. When someone loses something that you really want, you smile on the inside. You've crossed the line. And then same kind of thing. You get angry when someone gets it. Uh, that those transitions from not having it to having it, they were in the same category as you and not having it. And all of a sudden they have it and you don't. And it ticks you off. That's different than wanting, that's envy. All right, and it gets, it gets even more complicated here. Again, this, uh, forgive me for, uh, there's a lot of nuance in this definition. Wanting the wrong things. You can want something that's wrong. Did you know you can want something that's wrong? If you want another dude's wife, that's wrong, right? You want another woman's husband, that's wrong. Those are things that you're not supposed to want. So when you want something that God clearly says no to, envy. Wanting the right things at the wrong time. So you could, maybe you want influence and you haven't earned it yet. Or maybe you want a position that um, you're not ready for yet. Or I don't know, you want to do like a certain activity with your boyfriend or girlfriend or fiance that God says not to do that until a certain time, you know, where vows have taken place, whatever. You're like, maybe, maybe, hypothetically, you could want to do something, the right thing at the wrong time. It's not a wrong thing. It's just the wrong time, wrong time. Wanting the right things in the wrong amount. That's easy to slip into, right? I mean, money, food, both good things, right things, but you can want them in the wrong amount. And then lastly, and this is the one uh, that, that I feel like I wrestle with constantly in my life, is wanting the right things for the wrong reasons. You can want a right thing, but have a wrong motive for wanting that thing. You can want a degree for the wrong reasons. You want the letters after your name. 
You can want a job for the wrong reasons. You can want a spouse for the wrong reasons. You can want kids for the wrong reasons. You can want really good things for the wrong reason. And I want to point out the most common wrong, we, wrong, wrong reason. I want to point out the most common one. The most common wrong reason you can want something is that you think that thing is going to fulfill you. That thing is going to do something in your soul. You feel like you're missing something. You're thirsty for something. You're hungry for something. And you think this thing is going to satisfy that deep, deep longing in your soul. That is a wrong motive for wanting a good thing because, again, if you're a Christian, we believe that God is the only one. Your relationship with God is the only thing that can actually truly satisfy that deep longing in your soul. So, so what it does when you want a wrong thing for the wrong reasons is you've set yourself up to be incredibly disappointed because that thing is not going to be able to do what you're asking it to do. Your future husband is not going to be able to fulfill your soul. And if you go into a marriage expecting him to do it, you've put an expectation on him that's impossible. He can't do it. Same thing with kids, same thing with the job, same thing with anything in your life that you're asking it to fulfill you, it can't. So you can want a right thing for the wrong reasons. All of those together kind of box us in to say it goes from desire to envy. And I just want to point out, you might've noticed, it's really easy. Really easy to slip from, I just have this desire to envy. It's like a downward slippery slope, right? It actually almost feels easier to envy something uh, than it does to just want it in the right way, right? I mean, I just want to point out, it, I, those were eight things that I feel like, wow, every single one of them I could have slipped into. Desires, you got to be careful with your desires. You have to be really careful with them. So can we... I, I, we got to pause for a minute. Pause envy for a minute because we got to talk about desire. We got to talk about desire. You got desires, right? That's not a weird question. You do. You want stuff. Um, there is, in our culture, there is what I would call a prevailing myth. Um, and what I mean by that is like there's, there's a, a lie that we all kind of accept, maybe without really realizing, we, like you didn't sign a contract. You, 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 we don't even talk about it really like overtly, but it's something that our culture has kind of accepted. And what it's doing is it's leading us to some really uh, messed up places. And I can sum it up real quick. The, the, the prevailing myth that we all kind of accept um, is that desire is destiny. That desire is destiny in your life. That if you want something, it means something about you at like a foundational level, right? That, that your desire now is like your destiny, that, that you need to be true to that desire or you're going to miss out on your destiny, right? Like this, this, is a, this is a thing that our culture, but just watch movies, read books, read, read articles. You'll see that this, this myth is kind of mixed in. It's almost an assumption that we have that your desires equal destiny. If you say no to desires, you're missing something that you were supposed to experience because of your desire. Now y'all are sitting here going, wait a minute, you're saying that you're saying that's a myth. Yes, I am. I, first of all, I just want to know where, where do we get that? You gotta. This is like when in our culture, it's almost like being a fish in water. You don't even realize you're swimming around in it, right? Like you gotta be able to question these kind of things. You should be able to ask the question, why do we think that? Why do we think that desire equals destiny? Why do we think that if we, if we say no to desires, we're missing out on something that was supposed to be foundational for us as a human being? Why do we think that? Have you ever asked? You shouldn't just accept it. You should ask, where did it come from? So I have some questions about this thing, this little assumption that we have. Like, I want to say, no, I don't think your desires are destiny. Actually, don't think a lot of times that you're missing out on some thing that you were supposed to experience because you said no to desires. And I have two reasons for it. Two reasons for it. Here's my first reason. Your desires in your life, your desires have lied to you a lot. I think you know that. If you think back, you know that your desires, the things that have told you in our, our culture, another way our culture would say it is like your heart, right? Your heart, you're just, you know, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to follow your heart. 
<laughs> you tell my seventh grade daughter that. <laughs> First of all, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Secondly, I think we all know where that leads, right? So like, for, I don't know if it's everybody in the room, but you have to admit that your desires, your heart, it's told you something's gonna be awesome and it has not turned out awesome. Matter of fact, for some of you, your worst wounds in your life, some of your emotional scars that you have come from your heart saying, this is a great idea, and you finding out it was very much not a great idea, right? I mean, it just has, right? Your heart said, date that boy. It's gonna be awesome. And you found out later that it was not awesome, that that boy took your heart and ripped it out. And that actually is one of the worst pains that you've ever had. Your, your heart told you that it would be great to major in theater arts. <laughs> I don't know, forgive me if anybody did. I just don't think you've made your money back yet. That's, somebody came up to me. I said it first service. Somebody comes up and goes, I was really offended by that. I was a theater major. And I know him. I'm like, no, you weren't. <laughs> He's one of our security guards. I'm like, no, you did not. A liar. In church, even. Your heart lies to you. Your desires lie to you. Like, that's, that's why I think it's kind of absurd for us to say desires destiny. Like, even if you think about it for longer than five seconds at all in your own personal experience, your desires couldn't possibly be your destiny. They're terrible compasses in your life. Terrible. Think about this. What if you did like a, a, a social experiment this week with yourself and starting tomorrow morning, you just said the only parameter I'm going to use to make every decision this week, just one week, you just decided I'm going to do only what I want to do. And in that moment, I'm going to do it. Nothing else, no morals, no Bible, no God, no wife, no husband, no police, no judge, just I'm gonna do what I wanna do for one week. You know where you'd end up? Jail. <laughs> Whoever you were, you were way faster than first service. You got there quick. Jail, jail. You'd punch Bill at work because you think about it a lot, but you don't, but you don't use your desires as the way you operate in life. You have other reasons for doing things. You just T-bone that lady who cut you off, right? You just, you just accelerate into her because it's not your desires that's stopping you. It's actually your desires telling you to do it. It's, it's other things that prevent you from doing those things. So what I'm saying is if you just purely follow your desires, it leads to a horrible place. Why do we follow them then? Why do we trust them so much? Why has our society elevated them to the status of this is your compass in life? This tells you your destiny. I gotta tell you, I don't think it would. Actually, if we all did it, it would lead to the collapse of Western society. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't usually go there, so we won't. Hopefully it doesn't. Dear Jesus, please. Let me read the Bible talks about this. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I mean, if that's true, again, you're... <laughs> that's why I tell you, like, hey, I, I got a seventh grade daughter. Don't tell her to follow her heart. She needs other things. And I, I want to say the same thing about myself. I'm not going to follow this. I, I don't trust this. I don't trust this. We should question our desires. We can't use it as like a compass. And even more than that, I'll just touch on this. We've allowed as a culture, we, we even say stuff like your desire dictates your identity. Right? So it's even deeper than just like a compass for decision making. We've dropped it down a layer and we act like if you want something, that says something about who you are. And I just want to say, I want to propose that that's upside down. That, 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 that needs flipped. And we need to actually say that your identity should be dictating your desires. Your desires should not be dictating your identity. And I don't have time to preach a whole, that's like a whole sermon right there. But if we, I think it's a really weak way to make your identity based off of your desires. Really weak. That's how serial killers get made. <laughs> Don't do that. Here's my second reason. That was just the first reason. The second reason um, that I really, really, really dislike this desires equal destiny 
is this another false belief that you can't control your desires. Um, and I don't mean, so on one hand, I just want to say like you can't, the, 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 the initial desire, I don't think you can control that. Like it just kind of pops, right? You just, it's just like the thought happens, a feeling happens. You, you don't control those things. They kind of spark to life inside of you. Um, so I don't think you can necessarily control that. But everything that happens after that, let me give an example. So let's say I was pumping gas um, into my stupid minivan that has like, I don't know, 15 gallon tank. I know you guys own pickup trucks. You have spent like a bit million dollars to fill them up. Well, it was your choice. You bought it. I have a minivan. I had to buy that. <laughs> Anyways, I have four kids, guys. They just don't fit. We were going to be the cool people who bought like a big giant SUV, but it is just better. The, this, everything roll. Anyways, <laughs> trying to justify my lack of manhood. Um, if I were standing there filling up the gas tank and, you know, the numbers are rolling and rolling and rolling and a Tesla drove by, I wouldn't be able to control that little thought in my mind That'd be nice, right? That's, that's a desire, just kind of, it just kind of happened, just kind of popped into my mind. I didn't control that, I didn't decide that, it just happened. But think about this, so the spark happened. But what if I went home and I jumped on the internet and I started looking up all these articles about Teslas? What, what if I looked up a bunch of videos and started watching all these videos on Tesla? What would happen? The spark would grow. I fed that desire and it turned into a flame, right? And then if I started you know, finding people who own Teslas and talking to them about how awesome it is and I started following Elon Musk on Twitter and I did all that stuff, that thing that was just a little spark grew into a fire. But what I'm trying to point out is that beyond the spark, everything that happened after that was a choice, right? It was a choice and a choice and a choice and a choice that grew the desire from an initial into something else. So again, I'm not saying when I say you can control your desires, I don't think you can control the spark, but you can control everything you do after. You can either feed it or you can starve it. And that's why, man, I just don't buy this whole desire is destiny. You can't control it. You can, you have a lot. It might not be a switch you can flip in your heart, but it's a dial. And maybe the first little click happens without you controlling it. But every click after that, your hands on it. You choose what you want to do with that initial desire. That's why, man, I just, I've had a lot of people say stuff to me and I'm not like being mean, but I just don't feel anything for my spouse anymore. Okay. I mean, again, on one level, you can't really control that, but what are you doing? Are you doing anything? Are, you don't feel love. Are you doing any loving actions, right? Because again, it's like this weird reversal in our society. It's like you're supposed to feel and then do. But I actually think that a lot of times, especially the Bible kind of flips that on its head and says, actually, if you do, then you'll feel. So, so I just want to add, like, I just want to ask, if you're not feeling anything, are you doing some of the things that you're supposed to be doing? Maybe that would then produce the feelings. If you wait around for the feelings, you're never going to experience the actions. And even worse than, man, I, I, oh, I just, I have this feeling like I'm supposed to get divorced. Okay, well, maybe if you'd get off the blog, a happy, happily divorced blog that you read every single day of your life, maybe you wouldn't feel that way anymore, like, You're feeding this thing. I'm not saying that the desire didn't show up, but what are you, every decision you make after that will shape that desire or grow that desire or shrink that desire. You have a lot more influence than our society is giving credit for. Like you are totally uh, just at the will of your desires and you just have to be passive in that. No, you have choice in this. You can't flip the switch, but you can turn the dial. Desires are not destiny. Feelings are not fate. And even more than this, let me dig one layer down. Philippians 2.13 says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now, if you grew up in church, I bet you did the same thing I did with this verse. I read this verse as God is working in you, giving you the power to do what pleases him. I feel like that's the way I always read it. I always skipped that middle part, not on purpose. It just never jumped out at me until a couple weeks ago where that actually said that God has his hands on my desires too. 
It's not just because, you know, growing up in church, I was always like, I know the right thing to do. I actually kind of want to do the opposite. I got to grip my teeth and do the right thing. That's what it felt like. But this verse says that actually God can help you with those desires too. That is not, not only can you make some choices that affect your desires, but God himself wants to help you with that. That's crazy. I guess what I'm trying to point out is that your desires, they, they, I'm not saying they're not important, but I actually think there's a whole lot more movement there than we act like there is. That even God himself wants to help you with your desires. All right, I got to move. How does this happen? It's the same timer as last service. Can you guys, so there's this, preacher thing that I learned once that you can listen faster than you can talk. I'm trusting right now. You can listen faster than I talk because I'm going to start talking faster. Are you with me? Yes, you are. Good. Speaking it into existence. So back in the Old Testament, uh, there's a story about how God delivers the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, right? Even if you didn't grow up in church, you're pretty familiar with that. If you watch Prince of Egypt, you're up to speed. Good. Um, so they get out of uh, slavery. They're heading towards the promised land. They're on their way. They're in the wilderness and God does something absolutely spectacular. He supplies them with food where there is no food, right? Manna on the ground. And again, in Sunday school, you learned a lot about that. We've almost, we almost kind of gloss over this Christians. Oh yeah, the God gave him manna. Dude, that's crazy. Like they, they, they were in the wilderness. There was so many people. They couldn't have hunted. They couldn't have planted. They couldn't have harvested fast enough to feed them on this journey. God was the only way they could make it. They walked out of their tent and tripped over God's provision in their life. It was a miracle, absolute spectacular miracle. Here's how they treat it in Numbers 11 verse four. Then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. Yeah, they do tend to give you free things. When you're a slave, we had all the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic we wanted, but now our appetites are gone. For all we ever see is this miraculous, supernatural provision from God every single day in our life. Or manna. God is supernaturally supplying them with their needs, but they're like, yeah, but we'd like some meat. We'd like the menu expanded. God is literally keeping them alive and they want a good filet. And what they've done is they flipped want and need, right? They start using need when they should be using want. Now I want to get to how does God respond to this? If he's a good parent, no. <laughs> That's how I would respond. Verse 18, say to the people, purify yourselves for tomorrow. You will have meat to eat. You were whining and the Lord heard you when you cried, oh, for some meat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will have to eat it. Didn't expect that, did you? Would have thought God would have said no, but instead he says, no, here you go. Kind of like we talked about last week. Okay, okay. But look, he continues, verse 19, and it won't be for just a day or two or five or 10 or even 20. You will eat it for a whole month until you gag and are sick of it. For you have rejected the Lord who is here among you and you have whined to him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? God said, they said, hey, we want some meat. We have this desire. And God says, okay, but it's not gonna do what you thought it was gonna do. The very thing that you wanted, that you thought, again, was gonna fulfill something inside of you. God's like, I'm gonna give it to you and you're gonna find out it's actually not gonna work. It's not gonna do what you thought it was gonna do. So I just want to point out, and this is really important, that sometimes the worst judgment God can dish out is giving you exactly what you wanted, is giving you your desire. That's a judgment sometimes. And look at what Psalms 106, 15 says. And he gave them their request, but sent a leanness into their soul. Mm, that's a little haunting, isn't it? That you might have some desires inside of you that you're begging God to give you, and he could say, okay, but something could happen inside of your soul that, that that thing that he gave you turns to ash the moment it gets into your hand. Whew. That would be the worst. If you demand that God give you something, you demand God give you even a good thing and you hold him hostage to your desires, he may just say yes. And it'll turn out that it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. Now, envy 
You can't just get rid of it. You need to replace it. And I want to say the obvious replacement is contentment, contentment. And I just want to skip over the part where I tell you you're supposed to be content. You already know that, right? God leads us with contentment is great gain. You're supposed to be content. You're supposed to be content. You already know that. The real question is how, how, how to be content. Um, so I want to give you real quick three steps towards contentment. One, in your life, I want you to be really precise when you use the words need and want. Be really precise. Stop throwing the word need around. And I'm all about, you guys know this, I'm all about being sarcastic. I mean, I joke a lot and I use uh, exaggeration a lot to like prove my point. Um, but I, I got to tell you, if we throw the word need around, it gets inside your head. It gets inside your soul. So I'll even, I'll use one that we use it all the time. I, I've used it too. I'm not like dunking on you, but like we say like, oh, I need coffee. <laughs> your kids might need it you know, for you to have it, right? But I'm just saying, I would be really careful how you talk about it anymore because I actually think that, that something happens in our soul when we start to say we need something that we don't actually need because your list of needs are really short. Really, 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 really short. Everything else is a want. Everything else is God's goodness in your life. So be really careful using that word need and using that word want. Be really careful. It'll mess up your contentment if you don't. Second thing that'll help you with a content heart. Speaking of sarcasm, remember, God is smarter than you. And I just wanna say like, again, you're in church. I don't think if we would have took a poll as everyone was walking in, hey, do you think God is smarter than you? I don't think you would have been like, yeah, meh, maybe. Like you, you would say yes to this, right? But it's really weird though. When we get into those situations where we really want something and it's been a minute and God hasn't said yes to it yet, how we kind of have the attitude like maybe God's slipping a little, right? Like, like God doesn't have it. He's not on top of things in this area. Like God actually doesn't know here what he's doing. I know he doesn't, right? Isn't that weird? And we wouldn't say it like that, but that is kind of the attitude that we let slip in. I just want to, I just mentally, I have to put God back on his throne. When I'm struggling with wanting something he's not giving me. And this is an opportunity for faith, right? Because you can say, Lord, I, I want this. I don't see any reason why you're not giving it to me, but I have to trust that you're bigger than me and smarter than me and you run the universe. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this in your hands. And it's an opportunity to deepen your faith there. So remember that, that helps with contentment. God is bigger and smarter. And then lastly, Remember that God is enough. He's enough. He is. There's this, so I, I mean, I have four kids, so you can imagine I deal with a lot of wants that are, that are portrayed as needs in my life. Even things like video games. Evidently, I didn't know this, but you can die if you don't play video games enough. Um, so I have this, <laughs> one of my sons, uh, mm -hmm. He, he does this thing where he'll ask for something. He acts like it's the last thing he'll ever ask for. If we would just give him that, he won't. He'll never have to ask for another thing ever again. And it's hilarious. It's hilarious. So have you ever seen the show, the, uh, the movie, The Greatest Showman? And that one song that the, the lady sings called Never Enough. Me and my wife have started singing it back to him. Now, every time he makes some request, and we're not good at singing, we just do it anyways. I might start having like Alexa, play Never Enough. Like I'll have Alexa sing it for us. Um, but I, what it does for me is I like, yeah, he's 11. He's going to keep doing that. But it reminds me too. I'm happy for him because he continues to teach me lessons. God just whispers in my ear, you do that too. Because if you keep asking these things to fulfill your soul and you don't let me do it, it's not going to work, man. You're going to destroy those things. So me read you one more verse. Worship team, why don't you guys come back up? I didn't, this isn't on the screens. It's Hebrew uh, 13, five. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. What's interesting about that verse is it says, hey, don't, don't love money, whatever. Be satisfied, content, right? And then it says the reason is because God is with you. That's your reason for being content. That's the, the motivation. That's why you can be content is because you're not putting your faith 
your, your hope in a thing, you have God. And God is supposed to be enough, Christian. If you're a Christian and you believe you have a relationship with the God of the universe, that's got you. You don't need anything deeper than that. You have him and he can sustain your soul. If you really believe that, everything else is, is cake, man. Everything else is God's goodness and blessing in your life. And you're, you can allow those things to just operate as good things and God can be God in your life. So here's what I wanna do. They're gonna sing a song and I just want to challenge you right now to say, hey, what, what's the thing? You got a thing that you don't have that you want, that you maybe are flipping from a want into envy, that you're allowing this thing to slip into the wrong way of wanting it. What is it? I just want to, and maybe you asked that question to God. Uh, some of you know it already. God has been bubbling it to the surface this whole time. And you know that your desire has, has gone green there. But ask God. And then man, hand it to him. It's really hard sometimes. You got to unwrap your fingers from around the thing and hand it to him and say, I, I have this desire. It's a little jacked up, Lord. I really want this thing. And then man, beg him to give you the faith to trust him in it. Beg him to, to, to tweak your desire and change it to be something that honors him. And you can still ask him for it too. But go to him with it. Go to him with it. Pray with me. Jesus, I know there are people sitting here right now who have a deep and good desire in their soul. Lord. And they've been trying. They want to want it the right way, Lord. They do. Lord, I just pray that you would be with them in that, Lord. Help them to think about it and see it the right way. Help them to feel the right way about it, Lord. I pray for those people who've been sitting on desires that they've allowed to grow, Lord, that you don't want to grow, that you would work on that as well. That we would sit here, Lord, as a people with our hands open in front of us and our desires just laid bare before you, Lord. Do what you will. We trust you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.